Welcome to this video lecture on lift and drag. In this lecture, what we're going to do is talk about how we find lift and drag for complex objects. And um, it's often done experimentally, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit uh, in the video. So actually, if you take a look at your screen, you'll see what I'm talking about. So here we have a dog in the back of a truck traveling down the road. And um, let's say we were interested in finding the drag on this dog's face. Okay for whatever reason, who knows why you wanna do it, but you wanna find the drag on that dog's face. Now, modeling that analytically, you know, like through a, a by hand calculation, is, you're not gonna be able to do that unless you make significant assumptions. You could say, for example, the dog uh, looks like a cylinder in, in the flow, and then you might be able to model it based on that. It wouldn't be very accurate, wouldn't be a great way to go. It might be a back of the envelope kind of ballpark calculation, but it wouldn't be terribly accurate. You could do it computationally using computational fluid dynamics, something we've talked before, talked about before. Even that would be challenging. It's a complex geometry and it would take significant computational power to get what the drag would be on the dog's face. You could do it, but it, it just takes effort. More typically, when you're dealing with these complex objects like this dog's face, uh, you need to do it experimentally. You would build a scale model of the dog or you know just a model of the dog and put it in a wind tunnel. Don't put the actual dog in the wind tunnel. That, that wouldn't be very nice. Don't advocate hurting dogs and putting them in wind, wind tunnels. But you could build a scale model and then measure the drag force and then put that value in a table for some future use if you needed to know the drag on a dog for whatever reason in the future. And that's typically how it's done, is just the experimental uh, effort. So we're, we're going to talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. So let's go ahead and scroll through. Oh, by the way, I have here a, a mathematical limerick. Um, totally unrelated to fluid mechanics, but I thought it was kind of neat, so I'm going to go ahead and show it to you. So think about what that equation says. It's, the numbers in the equation are accurate. The numbers work out, but it's actually a limerick. So I'll give you a second to think about what it actually says. Okay, um, if you need to think more about it, just go ahead and pause. But what it says here is a dozen, a gross, and a score, plus three times the square root of four, divided by seven, plus five times 11 equals nine squared and not a bit more. Okay, I'll wait for you to finish laughing. Okay, very good. So um, it's just kind of fun. Uh, you can share that with your friends at a party when all this COVID stuff is over and done with and uh, you'll get a round of applause. Okay, let's go ahead and move on. We're gonna talk, talk about lift and drag. Some of this is kind of a repeat from what we've talked about in, a, in the previous lecture. And uh, that's fine, we, we just we need to kind of go through it again. But what I have is uh, two pictures, two sketches shown here on the screen. We have a bluff body on the left-hand side and a streamlined body. Um, what I wanna do is just show how we express the drag and lift for those kinds of objects um, in a dimensionless way. So the dimensionless drag is called a drag coefficient. It's a drag coefficient. And it's just the drag force divided by, we'll use a dynamic pressure multiplied by an area to make the drag dimensionless. So the dynamic pressure is just gonna be based on the upstream velocity. So here is the upstream velocity U infinity. It's just the velocity far upstream. So one half rho U squared is just a dynamic pressure based on the upstream velocity. And then we hit multiply it by an area to make it a force. The choice of area depends on what kind of object you're dealing with. For a bluff body, and I'll come back to that in a moment, but, but an object where most of the drag is based on uh, form drag, um, the area that we typically use is this frontal projected area. It's the area you would see looking in from the front. And if you're dealing with a streamlined body, here most of the drag is due to skin friction drag. The area that we typically use is the plan form area, which would be the area you'd see looking down from the top. So the area here will be either frontal projected or plan form. And the lift coefficient looks much the same. It's just the lift force divided by the dynamic pressure multiplied by the, the same kind of area. So the area that you use, again, depends on whether you're dealing with the bluff body. And just a reminder, the bluff body the drag due to form drag, that's the pressure component, is much larger than the drag due to skin friction. That's the shear stress component. 
And for a streamlined body, the drag due to skin friction is much larger than the drag due to form drag or the pressure drag. Form drag is pressure drag. Okay, so again, if it's a bluff body, we use the frontal projected area. If it's a streamlined body, then it's a plan form area. Now, if you're dealing with some sort of object that's not clear, it's somewhere between a bluff body and a, 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 a streamlined body, or you're not quite sure, all you have to do is just choose one or the other and just make sure everybody knows that's the area you used when you made the drag or lift dimensionless. So if you put the value of the, the drag, like, like take the dog for example. So you measure the drag force on the dog's face. You express it as a drag coefficient. You just need to let everyone know what area you used to make that drag coefficient. If you used a frontal projected area, you just tell people, you know, here's the drag coefficient for a dog's face based on the frontal projected area. If you use the plan form area, you'd say here's the drag coefficient for the dog's face based on a plan form area. You just let people know so it's not ambiguous. Okay. I guess I should also mention what I mean by drag force. So the drag force is the force that's parallel to the incoming stream direction. So you can see here the velocities in this direction, left to right. So the drag will be in the same direction. So that's the direction of the drag. And the lift is perpendicular to that. So you just choose a perpendicular direction, and that will be your lift direction. OK. All right, so that's how we form lift and drag coefficients. And, uh, and the next plot I have here is just the drag coefficient for flow around a sphere. I want to show this one because we often deal with spherical objects. You know, a lot of things are approximated as being spheres, like you know, the dog's head as a first approximation, maybe you treat it as a sphere. It's not a very good approximation, but you could do it nevertheless. Um, so since we deal with spheres so often in modeling, it's good to have a, 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 a plot that shows you how the drag varies with um, the speed past that sphere. And we, again, try to present this in dimensionless form. It collapses a lot of experimental data. And that's what you see actually on the plot here. Here's drag coefficient. Oops, let me erase that. Here's the drag coefficient on the vertical axis. It's on a, um, a log scale here. And then on the horizontal axis is a dimensional speed, which is really just a Reynolds number. So we know that Reynolds number shows up a lot when you deal with viscous flows. So drag coefficient versus Reynolds number for flow around a sphere. And you see this uh, that the drag coefficient decreases with speed for a while. And then there's a range where the drag coefficient holds steady. And then it drops suddenly at a Reynolds number of about 200,000. So that's about 200,000. That's where we have this drag crisis. And we talked about the form of this plot um, in the last lecture. Down here you have uh, what's called creeping flow or Stokes flow. That's where the viscous forces really dominate because the Reynolds number is very small. Remember, the Reynolds number is a ratio of a characteristic inertial force to a characteristic viscous force. So if the Reynolds number is very small, it means viscous forces dominate. So this is... This would be like the Reynolds number regime of protozoa and bacteria and things like that. And down here, the drag coefficient actually has an analytical value that you can derive. It's outside the scope of this course, but you can actually derive it. And it's equal to 24 over the Reynolds number based on the diameter of the, the sphere. So you can actually calculate the drag coefficient exactly for a small object. And you can see the experimental data, the points here, match that pretty well. It's a good... It's a good model. As the Reynolds number increases, so, so here's the Reynolds number of about 1 right there. So that's a Reynolds number of 1. Once you get above 1, then we get deviations from that Stokes um, drag coefficient. And in this region, everything above a Reynolds number of about 1, you have to rely on experimental data and empirical correlations. And so, you know, the, the drag decreases, then there's, like I said, this region where it's uh, nominally constant, and then there's this sudden drop. That drag crisis occurs due to boundary layer separation. So you go from being a laminar boundary layer that separates early in the adverse pressure gradient region that forms on the back part of the sphere. Um, so since that separates early, you get a large wake, and it's relatively low pressure, so you get a large form drag, and you get have, have a high drag coefficient. And then above a Reynolds number of about 200,000, the laminar boundary layer transitions to a turbulent boundary layer, has more momentum to it, 
stays attached longer. So it, because of that momentum, it can go further into the adverse pressure gradient region. You get more pressure recovery, you have a smaller wake, and then as a result, you get a smaller form drag and a smaller overall drag. So that's why we get this sudden drop in drag. So that's the drag crisis is due to a change in the change from a laminar boundary layer to a turbulent boundary layer. But uh, as far as getting what the drag coefficient is for various Reynolds numbers, um, we can use these curve fits, and these are just um, there are other curve fits available. These are just some that I pulled from the literature. For Reynolds number less than one, we use the Stokes drag law, just 24 over the Reynolds number. For Reynolds number less than between one and five, there's actually a an analytical solution to that one as well. It's a perturbation to the Stokes drag law. It's just kind of a a modification of it. You can see just a small, um, it's the Stokes drag plus some kind of correction factor associated with that. And then between about five and 200,000, you have this empirical relation. This is just an experimental curve fit. You can typically tell experimental curve fits because they're kind of complex looking. Um, so this is just an, an experimental curve fit for that wide range of values. And then um, in this region where it's holding kind of steady, this, I guess I didn't write these numbers quite correctly, but in this region from about, call it uh, 2,000 to about 200,000, the drag coefficient's about 0.44. You can sort of see that kind of comes over this way. It's about 0.44 in that range. Um, so, you know, you can use these correlations to get what the drag is on a sphere over a wide range of Reynolds numbers. And like I said, there are other curve fits people have used, but these are these are common ones that I show here. So I just wanted to show what the drag is on a sphere because we use that as a model for many different things. Okay. Now when you're starting to deal with much more complex objects, then we have to rely on experimental data um, completely. Possibly some computational data, but it, that's pretty time consuming depending on the complexity of the object. So a lot of times we just rely on experimental data. And so that's what I'm showing here is the drag on various two-dimensional objects. So these are planar, meaning they like the square cylinder. It, it's like a, a square cross-section to bar that comes in and out of the page. And so here is the drag coefficient based on the frontal projected area for a square cylinder. It's a drag coefficient of 2.1. Okay, so then, and it's based on the frontal projected area, so it would be based on the area you see looking from this side. Okay, and then you know you can rotate it a little bit and you get a different drag coefficient and then there are all these various shapes, right? So all these different shapes and the way these are typically found is either from an experiment, possibly a computation. Okay, and you can see, uh, you know, when you're dealing with uh, kind of these irregular shapes, sometimes you have to, you know, vary the show how the drag coefficient varies with the geometry of the object, and um, you put it in a table. And again, it's very important when you put these things in a table, you indicate what the drag coefficient area is being, what drag coefficient area is being used. Is it the frontal projected area or a plan form area? Okay, um, and a lot of times these data will actually be presented as a function of Reynolds number. Uh, these aren't that I'm showing here on the screen, but many times they'll be um, based on Reynolds number as well. Since we saw like flow, for flow around a sphere, it's a function of the Reynolds number. So even with these objects, there'll be a function of the Reynolds number. It's kind of alluded to here where you have a laminar and a turbulent case. They don't really give you exactly what Reynolds number divides those two cases, since this is just a very rough um, drag coefficient table. But more precise um, experimental data will have it as a function of Reynolds number. And here's another table just to kind of show you more information. This is for three-dimensional bodies at Reynolds numbers greater than about 10,000. So here's an actual cube. And again, the drag coefficient based on frontal projected area. You know, one that's kind of interesting here is, uh, here's a drag coefficient based on a person. And it's based on a, so here they actually give the data based on, um, if you take the drag coefficient times the area based on looking at it from the side, kind of like the person falling like a skydiver does, kind of like this direction headed downward. And then also based on um, if the person was falling kind of feet first, 
downward like that, right? <clears throat> so again, just I just wanted to show you examples of experimental data presented in terms of a, a drag coefficient uh, and just how it's put into a table. Okay. All right, um, so that was drag coefficient. Let me just show you some data for lift coefficients on a rotating sphere. So this one's kind of interesting. Uh, the plot I have here is the lift coefficient for a baseball. So you can see a baseball here, as well as a dimpled ball as a function of, this is, this is a type of Struhall number. Um, it's again, another dimensionless parameter, but the D here is the ball diameter. Omega here is the ball rotational speed. So how fast it's spinning. And V is the um, upstream speed. So let me just kind of sketch this out. So we have a ball, V is that, diameter is that. And then um, if it's spinning, that's the omega associated with it. And this would be the lift coefficient as a result of that spin. And the reason you get this, I'll, I'll describe in a moment why you get this, but it basically the, the flow, if it's spinning, it changes the boundary layer characteristics. And like I said, I'll, I'll describe that in just a moment. But you get some lift as a result of this. And so for like a baseball at these Reynolds numbers, and these are typical Reynolds numbers that you might find for someone, you know, who's a professional throwing a baseball. <clears throat> You see that you get this kind of a trend here. And this, this equation five, it's just a curve fit. I, I don't write it down here because it's not all that critical that you know what the equation is. But I just wanted to let you know that, you know, the data follow a trend and then people have put curve fits associated with it. So there's the data for that. And then um, you can see different, the different people did these experiments and they got different values and kind of plugged them in here. This one's kind of interesting. This, these curves are for smooth balls, so ones that don't have dimples on them. And I find this one particularly, particularly interesting because you actually get a reverse lift. So, um, for example, if you're throwing a curve ball, and let me see if I, can, if I can show this well. So let's say this is a, a pitcher's mound here. So here's the pitcher's mound, and here's the plate. And you have a pitcher that's throwing a ball, you know, from the mound to the plate, and they have some spin on it. Let me just say the spin is this way. We're gonna we're looking at this from above, and they throw the ball that way and has some spin on it. Typically, what would happen is that ball would um, that ball would actually curve, it would have a lift force acting on it that way. Okay, so as you throw it towards the plate, what would happen is the ball would come in and it would deflect that way. Okay, so I've kind of shown it as a curveball or slider here. Um, but interestingly, when you have a, a smooth ball, you can actually get a, a change in the direction of the lift. The, the ball would actually curve the other way for a very small range. It would actually go that way for a small range of these Struhall numbers. And to be honest, I don't quite know exactly the physics of that. Um, I haven't dug into the papers associated with it. I will say that I have actually had experience with that. I've thrown, um, I used to pitch baseballs a long time ago, back in undergrad and, um, uh, well, high school and, and uh, actually in graduate school as well. And um, I, I've had these kind of very smooth kind of wax balls that I would throw occasionally. And if you try to throw a curveball with them, sometimes they would actually curve the other way. It was very unexpected. I didn't understand it at the time. Um, but now there's actually some experimental data that I came across that kind of shows that that can actually occur. So I was kind of pleased to see that. Anyway, I just wanted to show you that, again, when you're dealing with complex phenomena like flow around a, a, a baseball that's spinning, it's often easiest just to collect that data experimentally express it as a lift coefficient, put it in a table or put it in a plot so that other people can you know, fit curves to it or come back and refer to it um, for their analysis. Now, let me just tell you why that kind of curvature happens. There, there are actually a couple of phenomena that can occur. One is called a Magnus lift. Uh, Magnus lift is, and you probably heard of Magnus rotors perhaps, um, but basically when you spin a, a cylinder or, or a sphere, in an inviscid flow, okay, 
if you have an inviscid flow, one where there's no viscosity, you won't get a boundary layer. Um, but the spin will cause an asymmetric um, pressure distribution over the surface of that cylinder or sphere. And because the pressure distribution over, over that object is asymmetric, it'll actually cause some lift on it. So, so that's a phenomenon known as, known as Magnus lift. And that can occur whether the flow is actually inviscid or viscous. Okay? So that's one effect that does occur. <clears throat> but for real objects where you have a viscous flow, the predominant effect is what I'm going to show you here on the screen in just a second. Um, it has to do with how the boundary layer behaves. So here's a spinning baseball. And let me just kind of show you. The ball is spinning this way. And what's happening is the flow is coming in from left to right. And over the top surface, because it's spinning that way, the velocity of the surface here helps the flow move from left to right because of the no-slip boundary condition. Remember that the flow is sticking to the boundary. So on the top surface, the flow is the, the spin of the ball is actually kind of carrying the flow from left to right, whereas on the bottom surface, because of the spin, the, the no-slip boundary condition is working against the flow of the ball. And so what ends up happening is you, um, the boundary layer separate, we're going to get boundary layer separation on this ball no matter what, but on the top surface, it actually is delayed a little bit. It go, you go a little bit further toward the back of the ball, so the boundary layer separation point might occur there on the back of the ball, I mean on the top part, whereas on the bottom, Boundary layer separation occurs a little bit earlier. And as a result of that, you get the wake becomes asymmetric. The flow is actually directed somewhat downward behind the ball, right? Because it, it carries a little further over the top than it does on the bottom because of the no slip boundary condition on the ball. And so you can see here that if the, the flow is coming in with horizontal momentum, but now it has some vertical component to the momentum then we know from Newton's second law that there must be some force acting on that fluid. That force is the force the ball exerts on the fluid. And then, of course, for Newton's third law, the fluid's exerting a force on the ball. And that force that it, the fluid's exerting on the ball is the lift force that, that causes the ball's trajectory to change. And so in this particular case, the uh, let me erase some stuff. In this particular case, um, because the flow is directed downward, um, the force acting on the ball will actually be acting upward. You get actually a lift acting on the ball. And so if gravity is pointing this way and the ball's, you know, headed, the ball's headed from right to left, what will happen is the ball just won't fall as fast as it normally would. If it didn't have, um, if, if it was just moving through a vacuum, the ball would fall at a, a rate just given by the gravitational acceleration, right? But because we're going through this fluid and there's this lift force caused by the deflection of the boundary layer, so the wake is kind of directed downward, you get this lift force that causes it to stay, it doesn't fall quite as fast. Okay, it stays elevated a little bit more because the lift force is countering the weight of the ball. So when you have a spinning object like this in a, in a real viscous fluid, you do have a Magnus lift component um, that I described before, but what really dominates the lift force is actually this kind of deflection of the boundary layer, and that 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 uh, is a bigger component. That's really what drives the the lift force on the ball. Okay, so if you have that physics in mind, you can start to think about what happens if you spin the ball certain certain directions. Which way will the ball move as a result of that? And that's kind of a all these different kinds of baseball pitches and how they move is, is very interesting. And I really encourage you to take a look at this video. Um, take a look at that video because it's, I'm not going to show it here because it won't come through very well in the recording, but it's a really neat video showing um, people throwing wiffle balls. A wiffle ball is a, is a very lightweight plastic ball. And um, when you throw it, if you put a lot of spin on it, of course you get a lift force, but it's, the lift is really dramatic because the ball has so little mass that the ball moves a lot because of that lift force. And so with these wiffle ball pitches, you see tremendous curvature on them, and it's a pretty cool video, so I encourage you to take a look at that. Um, and then the same effect of you know the ball spinning causing some lift on it. You see this in other sports as well. So it's not just baseball. It happens in cricket. It happens in soccer with the soccer ball moving. Of course, uh, table tennis, it happens there as well. So lots of different places where putting spin on the ball 
causes it to curve, and it's, it's because of this kind of boundary layer effect that I just described here. So anyway, take a look at that video. It's pretty cool. And by the way, there are some kind of neat books to read on the, on the physics of different sports. Um, I think there's a book called The Physics of Baseball, and there's similar books for other sport topics. Pretty neat to look at. I encourage you to take a look at it. Um, you know, get it from the library or uh, get it online so you can take a look at those books. They're pretty neat. <clears throat> okay, so now I'm going to talk, I'm going to continue to talk about lift, and specifically I'll talk about lift on airfoils. Of course, it has tremendous practical application with aircraft, um, also with hydrofoils, you know, like a, it's like a spinning propeller, for example, same kind of principles. So let me just talk a little bit about this. Uh, we're not going to get too deep into it. If you if you're really interested in lift on airfoils and such, you really need to uh, take an aerodynamics course where you'll get into it in a lot more detail. This will be very quick, just kind of give you the basics. But here we have an airfoil shape on the right-hand side and flows coming into it. They call it the relative wind here, but this is your upstream velocity. And um, let me just focus on some of the geometry of the airfoil shape. So the distance from the leading edge, that's the very front part of the airfoil shape to the very trailing edge, the very back part. If you draw a straight line between those, that's called the chord line. And of course the distance from here to here is called the chord length. Um, if you, since the airfoil may not be symmetric, it might, or yeah, may not be symmetric, it may kind of have an asymmetric shape from top to bottom. If I draw a line that goes right along the middle, like the center point, from top to bottom on that airfoil shape, that, that traces out the camber line. So the camber has to do with the curvature of the airfoil shape, okay? So that's the camber line is this blue line. And then you have the thickness of the airfoil, which is just the distance from, you know, moving along the, the cord line, it's the distance from the bottom surface to the top surface. And so you can get the thickness as you move along the surface of the airfoil or down the cord line of the airfoil. And then you have the maximum camber point here where it's the largest distance between the cord line and the camber line. Okay, You don't need to know all of these details, but you should probably be familiar with a cord line, what a camber line is, and just the concept of uh, the thickness. If you draw the angle between the incoming flow and the cord line, that angle is called the angle of attack. So it's just kind of the, the angle that the, the airfoil makes with respect to the up, upstream flow. Okay, so that's a little bit, of, um, a little bit of geometry. Now what I want to do is talk a little bit about how an airfoil generates lift. Um, you probably have some exposure to this. You probably heard this, you know, what, what causes it. Um, and uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about that, and then we'll, we'll just cover a couple of other little things after that. So what, what generates lift on an airfoil? Now, I think a lot of people probably have heard, well, it's Bernoulli's equation, that you have a higher velocity going over the top surface versus the bottom surface. And because of that higher velocity, because of Bernoulli's equation, if the velocity is higher, the pressure is lower. And so you get a low pressure side on the top and a high pressure side on the bottom. <coughs> Excuse me, and that's correct. That, that's indeed what happens. The velocity over the top is a little bit higher than the velocity over the bottom. And so you get uh, a pressure difference. And it's if you integrate the pressure over the bottom surface and integrate the pressure over the top surface, and you find the net force as a result of that, that's your lift. Okay. Now, the next question is, well, why, is you, why do you have a higher velocity over the top? What's, the, what's happening there? Um, and this is where some of the arguments go wrong. Well, people say, well, it's because the flow over the top has a longer distance to travel. Or the, uh, and because it has a longer distance to travel, um, it has to go from the leading edge to the trailing edge faster, so it meets up with the flow at the back at the same time. That's actually incorrect. And you can sort of see this from this picture here. This was from a computation showing flow over an airfoil shape. Um, release all these fluid particles here in the computation at the same instant in time and then you kind of track where they go at different times and what you see is over the, the top 
they, they don't reach the bat, the trailing edge at the same time. You see that the particles over, uh, over the top actually reach the trailing edge sooner than the particles at the bottom. So you can see the particles on the top actually have already passed the trailing edge uh, well before the particles at the bottom have reached the trailing edge. So it, it doesn't have to be an, an equal transit kind of argument here. What actually generates the lift is um, it, it's the curvature of the airfoil, the, the camber of it. And uh, I'm going to explain it here in this, this picture. It's actually easiest to explain it using a, um, a set of equations known as Euler's equations in streamline coordinates, but we didn't cover that topic in this course. So I'm going to just I'm going to just show it kind of physically in the picture here. Let's say we have some airfoil shape that's flat on the bottom, but it has some curvature on the top. <clears throat> and then the pressure far away from this airfoil is just atmospheric pressure, right? You know, when a plane passes overhead, you know, five miles over my head, I'm still at atmospheric pressure. I'm unaffected by the plane far away, right? So the far away from the airfoil, it's still atmospheric pressure. And the st streamlines, you know, relative to the airfoil are just going to be horizontal lines when I'm far away. Since the bottom of the surface is flat, then the streamline close to the bottom surface will also be straight and it'll still be atmospheric pressure there. Okay. Now, when I look at a streamline that's close to the curved upper surface, if I follow a fluid particle here, it's moving on this curved path, right? So here's a little fluid particle. Because that path is curved, that particle actually is being accelerated toward the center of curvature of that, that curve, right? There's some, there's some center of curvature here uh, that the particle is accelerated toward, right? You, you're familiar with this if, you know, just from basic kinematics. If you've got something moving around in a circle, it's accelerating towards the center of that circle, right? So it's accelerating toward the center of curvature. So this fluid particle is accelerating toward, something's causing it to accelerate toward the center of curvature of that, that surface or that, that streamline. If it's a Accelerating toward the center of curvature, what that means is that the pressure here on the top side of it has to be higher than the pressure on the bottom. Right? So we have some pressure gradient that's causing it to accelerate towards the center of curvature. Right? If it's, if it's moving on a curved path, then something is causing that acceleration. There, there's certainly an acceleration. That's the centripetal acceleration. And so there's some force that's causing that acceleration. That force is a pressure gradient, that the pressure on the outer part is higher than the pressure on the inner part, causing it to accelerate toward the center of curvature. So that means the pressure, as we move closer and closer to the surface of the airfoil, must be getting smaller and smaller. So if it's atmospheric pressure out here where the streamline is straight, and I know that that pressure is higher than the pressure on the bottom side, then the pressure on the surface here is going to be less than Pressure on the surface has to be less than atmospheric pressure, right? <clears throat> has to, just from the fact that there's some force causing the fluid particle to be pushed toward the center of curvature. So you can see then that because of this curved path, we have some pressure gradient that causes the pressure close to the surface to actually be less than atmospheric pressure. And so you get a smaller pressure on the surface, on the upper surface, than you do on the bottom. And as a result, you get a net lift force. So it's really the curvature of the streamlines that results in the pressure difference between the top and the bottom. Okay, so that's that's why you actually get lift on the airfoil. Um, it's not this equal transit time kind of argument. Okay, anyway, I, I thought that would be of interest to you to kind of see understand it in a more physical way why you get lift on airfoil surfaces. Okay, um, the way we express the lift on an airfoil surface is shown here. So this is um, just a, the lift coefficient on an airfoil as a function of the angle of attack. The more that you have, the, the larger the angle of attack, remember the angle of attack is given right here. Typically, the larger the angle of attack, the more, the more uh, lift you get. And so you have a larger lift coefficient. So you can see that as you increase angle of attack, you get larger lifts. So this is showing a cambered airfoil, one that has some curvature to it, versus a symmetrical airfoil. A symmetrical airfoil just looks exactly the same on the top and the bottom. So let me see if I can draw one. So here's the center line. 
So I've tried to make that as symmetric as possible. So it, 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 it has no net, the, the camber line and the cord lines um, coincide for symmetrical airfoil. So you can see when you have more camber, you actually get more lift. It's just extra curvature that causes the, the larger pressure gradient and you get more lift as a result. So you can see that as you increase the angle of attack, you get more and more lift and then suddenly it drops. And we don't worry about the lift after that because um, <clears throat> when you start to lose your lift suddenly, that's called a stall. And you don't want to have a stall because then you lose the lift on your airfoil and that's what's keeping you in the air. When you lose the lift on your airfoil, your plane starts to drop out of the sky and, and that's, you don't want that. So you always try to avoid stalling your, your airfoils. Now the reason that stall occurs is because of boundary layer separation. So I, I'm trying to show this over here on the right hand side through some photographs. So here's an airfoil at a relatively low angle of attack and you can see um, these are streak lines but it's steady flow so it's also streamlined. So you got you have flow going over the top, you can see the curvature of the streamlines, flow over the bottom and there's, there's a little more curvature over the top than the bottom so you get some lift. So this would be somewhere like down in here. Actually this looks like a symmetrical airfoil so maybe we're somewhere down in here. Then here we are at a higher angle of attack. We still have, um, even though it's an adverse pressure gradient on this part of the airfoil surface, it's not enough to cause boundary layer separation. Remember that if you have boundary layer separation, it was caused by an adverse pressure gradient. But just because you have an adverse pressure gradient doesn't necessarily mean you get boundary layer separation. The boundary layer may have enough momentum that it can carry into that adverse pressure gradient region and still stay attached. And that's what you're seeing here. So here, you can see this, the curvature of the streamlines, you know, you get a lot more lift. It's at a higher angle of attack. You might be over here for your lift coefficient, okay? But here, we have too much angle of attack, and what ends up happening is you actually get boundary layer separation occurring. So here, this point of separation is somewhere like right there. And so what's happened is you have too large of an adverse pressure gradient on the back half because it's it's such a large turn for the fluid to make to follow the the surface of the airfoil on the back half here and it separates and um, so you get this uh, wake region that forms here but notice the, the this curvature of the streamlines now the streamlines over the top really don't have as much curvature anymore right here there's a lot of curvature right in that region here there's there's a lot of curvature of those streamlines here they're kind of straightening out and so because of that stall, um, boundary layer separation, you no longer get that curvature and so you're going to lose the lift. Remember, it's that curvature of the streamline that causes, your, causes the lift to occur. And so we don't see that any longer here and, and the, the stall causes a, a drop, sudden drop in your, um, in your lift coefficient. So we don't want that. And as I talked about in the last lecture, one way that people have tried to design to avoid this is they put these vortex generators on the surface, just a little plate that causes the flow to swirl, forms a vortex, hence the name vortex generator, and that vortex generator brings in high momentum air from the outer flow into the boundary layer, re-energizes it, gives it more momentum, and then it can carry further into the adverse pressure gradient region and you delay stall. You get more drag, but you delay the stall, so that's typically desirable. So anyway, that's, this is what kind of a typical lift coefficient versus angle of attack plot looks like. One other thing I'll just mention here is, um, you know, the, between cambered and symmetrical airfoils, a lot of times wings are designed, especially on commercial aircraft, to change how much curvature they actually have on the wing during different parts of the flight. So you've probably seen this when, you, when you're on commercial flight. So here's the wing during cruise like when you're up at altitude flying along, um, it's kind of a, a thin shaped wing. Um, but when you go into, when you take off or land, you'll often see um, a, uh, a flap that comes down. Sometimes they actually have multiple flaps. So you'll have these little winglets that, they're not winglets, but they're, um, they're called flaps that come out of the back part or the trailing edge of, your, of the main wing. And so you see these little bits that kind of come out during takeoff and landing, and they're there to provide additional 
camber to the wing, additional curvature. You can sort of see how much more curvature they provide. So the reason for that is because it gives you additional lift. You can see the difference here between symmetrical versus cambered. You get additional lift at a given angle of attack and a given speed. All right, because <clears throat> at slow speeds, when you're just taking off, you don't have a you don't have a, a very high speed. Remember, the lift coefficient is let me write this down here. Lift coefficient is the the lift over one half rho v squared times the area. So if you're just taking off, let's say, you have a low speed, right? And if it's a low speed and a given lift coefficient, you're not going to get very much lift, right? Because let me just rearrange that equation. The lift is the drag, is the lift coefficient times one half rho infinity squared times the area. So during takeoff and landing, your speeds are slow, so you don't have as much lift. Again, you don't want to stall as you're about to take off or land, so the way to get more lift is so you can't change the speed too easily. Instead, you change your lift coefficient, and the way you change your lift coefficient is you go to you produce more camber. And you can produce the camber by putting your flaps down. And then on the front, there are things called slats that look this, the same. It's just something that comes out of the front of the, um, the main part of the wing, and it just adds more curvature to the wing, gives you more camber. Now, when you're flying at altitude and you're flying at a high speed, when, when your velocity is really high, you don't need quite so much curvature to your wing. Your lift coefficient can be actually pretty small because you're traveling at such a high speed, you can have a small lift coefficient and then just gener generate enough. You only need enough lift to balance the weight of your aircraft, right? That's, you only need, you just want your aircraft to hold steady. So you only need to balance the weight. So when you're at high speed, you need a small lift coefficient and so they, they'll retract the slats and flaps back into the wing, and so you don't, have, you don't have as much curvature. And you want to do that because when you put this curvature in here, it increases the drag. Um, so you don't want to pay that drag penalty during cruise. So anyway, next time you go flying, um, you might want to just take a look out the window. You hear all these weird noises during takeoff and landing, and that's because these things are being moved out mechanically or pulled back in. All right. Um, the last thing I'll talk about in this lecture are just how you can get lift and drag coefficients for various airfoil shapes. There's been a huge amount of study because of the practical relevance of um, airfoils. And so there are these um, databases where you can get lift and drag coefficients and other information about different airfoil shapes. And one, one common database are for what are called NACA um, types of airfoils, NACA. This is a precursor to NASA. I think this is, um, <clears throat> I can't remember the exact abbreviation, like National Aeronautics, so, uh, I, I, I'm not going to get it right, but it's the precursor to NASA. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so there are all these NACA airfoil, um, th there's, there are databases of NACA airfoil characteristics. The numbers here correspond to the shape or the geometry of the airfoil. I won't get into the details of that. But you can go to these, I give at the very bottom here, oh here it is, National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. You can go to that website and you can look at all different kinds of airfoil shapes and get what the lift and drag coefficient uh, look like for those airfoils. There's a University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign airfoil database. And then this, this website here actually does calculations given a particular geometry of wing, it'll actually calculate what the lift and drag uh, are on that wing. So here's, here's a, like a, one of the particular airfoils, and this is what the lift and drag coefficients look like as a function of the angle of attack for that airfoil. So you can see, at, you know, as the angle of attack, this is angle of attack in the horizontal axis here. As you increase the angle of attack, you get more and more lift, and then you reach stall. The different lines here, I believe, correspond to different Reynolds numbers. The negative angles of attack just have to do with the, the, you know, the airfoil looking like this. Let me sketch it down here. So here's a positive angle of attack, where it's kind of like that. Ned negative angle of attack would look like this, with angles like that. Okay, it just means that you get lift just in the opposite direction. 
And then here we have the drag coefficient as a function of angle of attack. Kind of, it looks kind of like that. So as you go to increasing angles of attack, you get increasing amounts of drag, as you might expect. OK. Um, so anyway, you can take a look at these databases if you want to just see you know, for yourself what different airfoil shapes look like. And you might be able to find characteristic airfoil shapes for different commercial aircraft, for example, like for a 747 or you know, aircraft like that. I haven't looked for it myself, but I'm sure it's in there. All right, so that covers everything I wanted to say about lift and drag. The main, just kind of re, to re, I've talked about a lot of different things, so let me just kind of um, recap. When you start dealing with complex objects, you typically have to rely on experimental data or possibly computations, but experimental data from scale models is very common. When you make those lift and drag measurements, we typically make them dimensionless using a lift coefficient and a drag coefficient. The area that we used in the in the area that we use in those lift and drag coefficients can either be based on the frontal projected area, especially if it's a bluff body, or the plan form area if it's a streamlined body. But it's always best to just identify what area is being used so there's no ambiguity about it. And then once you have that information, you can put it in a table or a plot, put a curve fit to that data, and then use it for whatever purpose you need it for. Okay, so that's typically how it's done when you de start dealing with complex objects. Um, <clears throat> for the lift coefficient, um, you can generate lift, especially like, like around a sphere or a cylinder, by rotating, rotating the object. And um, that lift, there are two effects. There's a Magnus lift, which we didn't really talk too much about. But really what dominates is just the behavior of the boundary layer over the surface because of the, the movement of the surface affects um, how far the boundary layer can travel into an adverse pressure gradient region. And because if it's rotated, the object is rotating, the surface speeds will be in opposite directions because of the rotation. So they can either help the boundary layer or um, work against the boundary layer. And it'll deflect the wake and then cause lift as a result of that. Um, and then as far as airfoil shapes, we just talked a little bit about some of the geometric features of an airfoil, like the, the cord line, the camber line, thickness, angle of attack. And uh, we talked about what causes stall, uh, what causes lift on the airfoil, um, why stall occurs, and then uh, just showed some typical lift and drag coefficient data versus angle of attack. All right, we'll go ahead and end it there.